Exclusive. That's pretty strange. Mike was in there. Mike was like, why didn't you use the new one? Let's see here. I said, well, it's on the he side. All right, guys, we're on, we're on recording now. So. Everybody behave. <laughs> we're so glad you came. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <clears throat> so for all of you out there in recording land, I'm trying to explain to this insane group of students here about the canon of the Old Testament Scripture. So <clears throat> let's just take a little walk through Dan's Hebrew Bible here in just a minute, and we'll get a feel for how this thing is put together. So we open up the back, and we get the text of the front, and... We look in what is the title page, and it says over here, Torah, Torah, <coughs> the law. This one says Nabi'im. I taught you what the word Nabi means in the Old Testament. A Nabi is somebody who does what? What is a Nabi? No, it's a prophet. So, Nabi'im are the prophets. So, we got the law, the prophets, the, which means and, kasubim, and the writing, the writings, or called the Psalms. So, you got law, prophets, and writing is the, in, is the content of this volume. Then we get to the first part of the law, and we've got the book of Genesis right here. And, of course, we've got your Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and all that kind of good stuff. Then we got Deuteronomy. Joshua and Judges. And then we don't have any Ruth in there. We've got Samuel 1. And then we've got Samuel 2. And then we've got Regum, or Kings, 1. And we've got Kings 2. And then, uh-oh, right after the book of Kings, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, what do we got? Isaiah. Isaiah. Right after Kings. And then we've got Jeremiah. And then Ezekiel. And then, you know, it should be Daniel after Ezekiel, right in ours, but unfortunately, no, we've got Hosea. And then Joel, see this is the twelve, what they call the twelve, the books of the twelve minor prophets. Jonah, Micah, finally Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And then, what do we got? We got Psalms after Malachi. I thought it was before Malachi. No, Psalms is not before Malachi. That's what I wrote down. Okay, so it's after. Yeah, Psalms is the first book in the last section. Okay. <laughs> it's, um, Jesus called it the Psalms. Some people call it the writings. Then after Psalms, you got Job. Wait a minute, I thought Job was supposed to be before Psalms. But he's not. <coughs> then you got your Job, and then keep flipping. And then you got Proverbs. Then you've got Canticum Canticorum, which is the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon. And then you've got Ecclesiastes. And then you've got Ruth. And then you got Esther. And then you got Daniel. Daniel. 
And then you've got Ezra, after they got led out of captivity. And Nehemiah, where they built the wall of the Jerusalem. And then you've got the summary of the whole thing and the overview of the whole thing in Chronica 1 and Chronica 2. And then you get to the front, which is the back, and that's it. So, <clears throat> that a little different way of looking at what I've tried to put up on <clears throat> the chart. And this is the order in which you confront the books of the Bible in the Hebrew Bible. Okay. So, law, prophets, writings, or psalms. Third section. See, the last book of the twelve, Patty, is Malachi. Yeah, I had just written down when you made that statement, I had written down that it comes before Malachi, and so... Yeah. I just didn't write the right word down, so I'm going okay. to repeat it again. All right, so here is the real question that was actually involved for the people when they accepted a book as scripture. The real question for the people was who wrote this book? Who? 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 Who wrote this Bible book? Who? 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 See, that was the question. And <clears throat> that, was the, that was the key to whether it was accepted into the canon or not. So this is the major thing I want you to get out of this section of class. So I'd suggest you write it down and memorize it pretty much. When the people of God universally accepted a person as a prophet of God, the writings of that person were immediately and automatically accepted by the people as Holy Scripture. So let's, let's pull this statement apart a little bit. This is what, what I found to be true by looking at the actual books and evidence itself. When the people of God, the Israelite people, uh, universally is <laughs> because this is not like some random Israelite said, hey, I'm a prophet, and everybody said, you're not a prophet. No, that's not what it was. When all of them, everywhere, had no question that this guy was a prophet of God, when they universally accepted a person as a prophet of God, like nobody had any doubt about Moses, see? The writings of that person, if it really came from him, were immediately, not, not a thousand years later, but immediately and automatically, without question, accepted by the people as Holy Scripture. All right, so this is what we call the canonical principle. This statement explains why a book was accepted as Holy Scripture. Yes, Brother Jeremiah. How does that play into uh, some of the things we have recorded? Like uh, you know, you're talking about universal acceptance. Yep. Um, but Elijah with Jezebel and Ahab, you know, they, they called Elijah the troubler of Israel. There were a lot of people who didn't believe Elijah was a prophet. Oh, they and believed it, he was a prophet. They just didn't believe he was a prophet of Baal. See, their God was Baal, and, and he was a prophet of Yahweh. Okay, so did it were, were his writings immediately automatically accepted after it was all said and done? Like whenever, like after Mount Carmel, you know, the Lord is God. Did they that, accept it? Or was that would it have been immediate? one. That would have been one reason why he was universally accepted. Okay. All right, so let's take as a test case first Moses, good old Moses. You know, you read through the the account of Exodus, and he's born in Egypt, and he he uh, gets 
to the burning bush in Exodus 3 and God calls him and he doesn't feel like he can do it, but he goes and, you know, God says, what is that in your hand? And he says, well, it's a stick. And God says, well, throw it on the ground and we'll make it a snake. And it did become a snake and he picked it up and it was a stick again. <clears throat> and uh, that stick he used to turn the Nile into blood and depart the Red Sea and to do all that kind of stuff. And Moses was the one, you know, that uh, confronted God. We have that story. And, you know, we have this story that uh, he was the one that went before Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And he was the one that uh, went up on the thundering, lightning, fire, burning mountain. <clears throat> and... He, he went up into the clouds and talked to God. And then when he came down, the Bible says his face was glowing when he came down. And he gave him the Ten Commandments. If, if any part of this story is true, none of the people had any doubt that Moses was a prophet. They knew that he had a hotline to God. And, uh, you know, it says that his face was glowing 2 Corinthians 3, when he came down from the mountain, so much so that they couldn't even look at his face and they had to, he had to put a veil over his face <clears throat> so that they could look at him. So there was no question in the minds of the people that Moses was actually and truly a prophet of God. Now I want you to, I want you to turn to Exodus 24 with me just real quick. Exodus 24, <clears throat> because all these theoretical um, evolutionary theories about canon don't deal with these things in the history of God's people. So Moses goes up the mountain, and he ends up going before God and spending some time with him. And then he comes back down the mountain in verse 3, 24, 3. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice. Now look at how they responded. Everything the Lord has said, we will do. See, immediately when Moses reported this, 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 and this, they said that's what the Lord has said. They, they didn't seem to question that. And then it says Moses wrote down everything that the Lord has said. Now drop down to verse 7. <clears throat> 24-7. Then he took the book of the covenant, where he wrote all this stuff down, see in verse 4, and he read it to the people. Now look at the people's response. Now see, this is where we get canon, when the people accept it as Holy Scripture. The people responded to the reading by saying, we will do everything the Lord has said we will obey. So it looks to me that already during the lifetime of Moses, when he came down the first time from the mountain, they already accepted the stuff he wrote as the stuff the Lord had said. Okay, they didn't wait for a council they didn't wait for him to die and get, be buried for 500 years. They already knew it. The mountain was still on fire. I mean, they knew this was from God. And they had no doubt. Well, if you continue to read um, the book of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you find out that God didn't give it to them all in one lump. God gave revelations to Moses all along, and Moses wrote those things down as they came to him. <clears throat> and at the end of Deuteronomy, if you go all the way over to the book of Deuteronomy, to Deuteronomy chapter 31, Deuteronomy 31, and let's read, Aaron, read verses 24 through 26 there for us. Which verses? Deuteronomy 31, 24 through 26. Okay. 
It came about when Moses finished writing the words of this law in a book until they were complete, that Moses commanded the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may remain there as a witness against you. All right, that's, know- that, that's good. So, um, notice he, he wrote the whole thing, and then he commanded the Levites, see the Levites were in charge of the tabernacle, to place this book of the law beside the Ark of the Covenant. Now, where was the Ark of the Covenant? In the Holy of Holies. Yes, that's right, in the most holy place. Do you think anything that wasn't special could go in there? No. No. So the very fact that they put this book inside the Holy of Holies by the Ark of the Covenant shows you the status that this book of Moses had. And Moses was still breathing. He was still alive. See? So why didn't they wait for a council to meet or something? Because when the people of God universally accepted a person to be a prophet of God, whatever that person wrote was immediately and automatically accepted as Holy Scripture. Moses has got a hotline to God and everybody knows it. If he wrote it, it's Scripture. End of story. So that was the process that took place with the law of Moses. Now, part of, part of here, you have the song of Moses, which was part of the, the law of Moses, which is a song. And then you have the account of the death of Moses in Deuteronomy 34, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Very likely, uh, Joshua wrote that part, part of it. <clears throat> Maybe a couple other things. But uh, <clears throat> it was immediately accepted as Holy Scripture uh, because Moses wrote it. Now, there's another scripture I wanted to give you if I can find it here. In the book of Numbers, see if I can find what I'm looking for here. Okay. Let's see. Well, I'll find it for you later. But it's talking about the fact that Moses wrote down all the record of the journeys of Israel. And uh, he recorded all their, all their journeys as they went from place to place. And that's another example of the things that Moses wrote down, which were part of the law. Okay. So. Maybe 30, 33 too? What is it? 33.2, Moses recorded their starting places according to their journeys by the command of the Lord. Is it Numbers 33.2? Numbers 33.2. Yeah, that's what I wanted right I, there. Yes. I just happened to see it. That's your credit. Yep. Nope, but it's good. Numbers 33, 1 and 2. Good deal. So, uh, you know, they put the book of the law in there where only the high priest could go once a year. And, and the Bible tells us as we proceed that the priests kept this sacred autograph of the law and they made copies off of that autograph to give to kings later on and different people. So it was, it was placed in that holy place. Now, we come to Joshua. See, Moses, if you remember the story, Moses went up the mountain And uh, he died, and Joshua was uh, ordained in Numbers 27 to be the leader of the people. And so when you get to Joshua chapter 8, if you turn your Bible over there, after the conquest of uh, Jericho, Joshua takes this book of the law of Moses, 
And see, what we're looking at is, remember, did the people of God accept the law of Moses as Scripture? Well, we see that they did during Moses' lifetime. But uh, in Joshua 8, Joshua gives them this uh, big lecture, and he kind of has them renew their commitment to the covenant, see? And in verse 34, it says... Afterward, Joshua read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curses, just as it is written in the book of the law. And there was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read to the whole assembly of Israel, including the women and children and aliens who lived among them. So here you have the renewal of this covenant based on the reading out loud of the entire law of Moses, notice he says all the way through it to the blessings and the curses. Well, turn your Bible back to Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. See, they didn't have chapters and verses. But one of the things that characterized the ending of Deuteronomy was the blessing and the curses. See, if you look at Deuteronomy 27, you've got all those curses Cursed be this, and cursed be that, and all the people saying amen. And if you look at Deuteronomy 8, 28, 1, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow His commands that I give you today, the Lord will set you high above all the nations. Verse 2, all of these blessings will come upon you. Verse 3, you'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. Verse 4, the fruit of your womb will be blessed. All these blessings, okay? But then if you drop down to verse 15, Deuteronomy 28, verse 15. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees, then all these curses will come upon you. You'll be cursed this way and cursed that way. That's Deuteronomy 28, verse 15 and following. So you've got the blessings and the curses. So... When he says, and you'll find this later on in the Old Testament too, they read from the beginning, they read all the way through the blessings and curses all the way to the end. Well, that's right at, near the end of Deuteronomy. See, the blessings and the curses. So what does this show you that Joshua, in the renewing of the covenant, felt it so vitally important to read this whole book to all these people? Does it not show you that the people accepted the law of Moses as Holy Scripture? I think it does. Uh, Also, you know, at the first of Joshua, Joshua 1, 7, 8, God told Joshua not to depart from the book of the law of Moses to the right or to the left, but to do exactly what it said, and he would prosper. So it was obviously being handled as Scripture. Uh, Look at uh, Joshua um, 24. Joshua 24. Look at verse 26. Joshua 24, verse 26. Let's see. Carl, have you got it by any chance? I do. Read it, Homer. All right. Joshua 24. Verse 26. It says, And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and he took a large stone and set it up there under the oath that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. All right, so this shows that Joshua actually added stuff to the book of the law of the Lord. And so... We know that Moses, by and large, wrote the law. And here it says that Joshua added stuff to the law, whether that uh, is meant to include parts of the book of Joshua or just the end of the law or what that means. It's, it's not clear, but certainly Joshua was a biblical writer as well. Okay, so the law of Moses is what we're dealing with right now, the first part of the canon. Uh, when you get to the time of, of uh, David, over here in, in 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 2, 
King David is about to die, and he says to Solomon, Be strong, walk in his ways, keep his decrees and commands, his laws and requirements as written in the law of Moses, so you may prosper. So it looks like David fully accepts the law of Moses as scripture. And of course, if you, if you um, read Psalm 119 or Psalm 19, um, let, let's just go over, for, for example, to Psalm 19. This is one of David's psalms. Uh, verse 7, <clears throat> Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. See, the word for law is Torah, Torah. So, you know, in the Hebrew Bible, it said Torah, v'navi'im, v'kesuvim, the law and the prophets and the psalm. Well, the law of the Lord, that's Moses' books, is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes, that's not statues, but statutes like laws of the Lord are trustworthy. The precepts of the Lord are right. The commands of the Lord are radiant. And so, you know, look, verse 11, by them is your servant warned in keeping them. There uh, is great reward. And so, you know, throughout that psalm, it's obvious that David greatly respects and reveres the law of the Lord as Holy Scripture. And there's many other references uh, that say the same thing. Look at Psalm 119. The longest psalm. Which is really cool in Hebrew because it's an acrostic in Hebrew. Psalm 119. Uh he talks about the law of the Lord and how wonderful it is. Uh, verse 11, one of my favorite verses, I have hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Uh, you know, the whole psalm is about the law, but it's obvious from this psalm, if you read this psalm, that David reveres the law of Moses as holy scripture. There's no command, there's no question about it. <clears throat> so, I mean, you read about Samuel. It's obvious Samuel obeyed the law. David obeyed the law. What does that tell you? They accepted it as scripture. Why was it accepted before them? Why did the people of Israel recept, accept it in the first place? Because they knew who wrote it. It was Moses, the man of God, the greatest prophet that had ever lived. That's why they accepted it. So, the book of the law was accepted in the time of Josiah. This is 622 B.C. Um, look at 2 Kings 22. Now, see, some of, the, some of the liberals, like in the Wellhausen theory and the form critical theory, they would tell you that the law wasn't even finished and wasn't accepted until like 400 B.C. But according to Scripture itself, it was accepted in the time of Moses and in all these generations uh, thereafter. Second Kings, if I can get my head in the game here. 22. This would be 622 B.C. Second Kings 22 with the young King Josiah. So he finds... Hilkiah the priest goes up and he finds this old book that's been neglected in the temple. He blows the dust off of it and brings it to this secretary. Verse 8, Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. And he gave it to Shaphan who read it. Then Shaphan the secretary went to the king and reported to him. Your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the workers. Verse 10, then Shaphan the secretary informed the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And he read it in the presence of the king. And when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. And you'll, you'll see that uh, he, he said the, the anger of the Lord must be burning against us because we're not living according to this law. And he instituted a great 
revival, to go back to the law. So obviously he revered the law of Moses as Holy Scripture. God let him live a little longer because he turned back to the law. Daniel <clears throat> respected the law of Moses. In fact, Daniel confesses his sins in, in uh, chapter 9 of Daniel. And he tells God in his prayer that the whole reason any of them are in captivity in the first place is because they've disobeyed the law of Moses. Um, Daniel chapter 9, go down here to verse 5. We have sinned and done wrong. We've been wicked. We have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and your laws. Drop down to verse 11. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the word spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing upon us great disaster. Verse 13, just as is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. So here's Daniel in the middle of the Babylonian captivity, obviously believing in the scripture, the law of Moses, and believing that the whole reason they're in captivity is because they've disobeyed the law of Moses. So what does that show? That shows that the people of God unquestioningly, unquestioningly accepted the law of Moses as Holy Scripture. Well, why did they do that? Because their forefathers and their forefathers and their forefathers did back to the time of Moses. And everybody knew that Moses was the one that helped get them out of Egypt and help bring on all those plagues and help uh, get the law off the holy mountain. So it was because of who wrote the, the law of Moses. <clears throat> then one of the great passages after the captivity, <clears throat> about 460 B.C., you've got Ezra and Nehemiah. You've got Ezra the priest in, in Nehemiah chapter 8. Let's turn to Nehemiah chapter 8. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> and see, this, this passage really does speak to the attitude of the people toward the law of Moses. <clears throat> Nehemiah 8, verse 1. All the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. That's at Jerusalem. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. And he read it out loud from daybreak until noon. <clears throat> End of the verse. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform built for that occasion. See, this was, this was very important stuff. And uh, it says, you know, in verse 5, look at this. Ezra opened the scroll and all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, they all took a knee. No, they didn't take a stinking knee. They stood up. And Ezra praised the Lord and the great God and all the people lifted up their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. And they bowed down and worshipped. See, they greatly respected the law. And the people stood up all day listening to the law out of respect. And notice, verse 8, they read from the book of the law, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. <clears throat> so you can see how deep their respect was for the law of God. No council had ever voted on it. No group of rabbis had ever gone this or that. The people had accepted it because they knew who wrote it. It was from Moses, the great prophet of God, and they knew their history. See? So 
all of this is evidence for a different story altogether than Brevard Childs or some of those guys would write in their idea of how the law of Moses came together. See? Jesus. Now that's a big name, isn't it? <coughs> uh, Jesus accepted the law of Moses. Let's read Matthew 5. <coughs> Matthew 5, let's look at verse 17 and 18. Brother Ben, how about it? Right. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. All right. You can just read that statement. First of all, he separates the law from the prophets like it does in the Old Testament. But his respect for the law of Moses is boundless. He, he respects it completely. Not one letter, not one stroke of a letter shall pass until it's all been accomplished. And then he tells him, if you're going to be under the rule of God, you're going to be one that keeps these commandments and teaches other people to do so. So the law of God was sacred to Jesus, just like it was to Ezra and Daniel and Josiah and David and Joshua. And all the way back to the people in the time of Moses. Do you get the principle based on this one, at least why they accepted the law of Moses? <clears throat> when the people of God universally accepted someone to be a prophet of God, whatever that person wrote was immediately and automatically accepted as Holy Scripture. Nobody had to vote on it. It was just a duh. Of course it is. <clears throat> All right, so, you know, you could multiply evidence on that in the Old Testament and show how many people quoted the law of God. The prophets always encourage people to go back to the law of God. But um, that's basically the approach that we use in why was the law accepted as canonical. And then we've got these books called the Prophets. So you've got the law of the prophets and the psalms, the law of the prophets and the writings. So why were the prophets accepted as canonical? And what can we show about that? Let me see what Mickey Mouse says. Oh, yeah, we've got time. We've got plenty of time. Let's take old Joshua. Now, Joshua, you know, has the same name as Jesus. And Jesus... Jesus' mother called him Joshua his whole life and never knew any different. But but people that wrote the Greek New Testament put it in Greek as Jesus, and we got Jesus from that. But Jesus and Joshua, same name exactly. Yeshua means salvation. But this Yeshua was the son of Nun, and he was Moses' buddy. And it was Joshua who fought all the battles of Israel. Remember the story of when Moses' <coughs> arms were being held up in the air and, and uh, Joshua's down there fighting the battle and whenever Moses' arms go down, they start to lose and when the arms go up, they start to win and uh, Joshua was Moses' friend. Uh, Exodus 33 is one of my favorite passages about Moses and Joshua. But let's let's go before that. Let's go back to Exodus 32. Exodus 32. <clears throat> uh, this is when Joshua was up there with Moses on the Mount Sinai. Exodus 32:15. <clears throat> Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people shouting, he said to Moses, There's the sound of war in the camp. 
And Moses replied, it is not the sound of victory, it is not the sound of defeat, it is the sound of singing then I, that I hear. <clears throat> Point being, Joshua was up the mountain with Moses. See, all the people were down there in absolute awe at the thunder, lightning, fire, and everything, but Joshua was up there on the mountain with Moses. Look at chapter 33. <clears throat> Look at uh, <clears throat> verse 7 through 11. 33, 7 through 11. Adam, how you doing over there, bro? Doing good. Kind of hold your Bible over toward that microphone and read it out for us. All right, yes, sir. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp a good distance from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. <clears throat> and it came about, whenever Moses went out to the tent, that all the people would arise and stand, each at the entrance of his tent, and gaze after Moses until he entered the tent. Whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would arise and worship at each at the entrance of his tent. Keep going. All right, all right. Thus, the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses returned to the camp, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Now, isn't that interesting? So Joshua was at the tent where Moses met with God, just like Moses was. Do you think all the people knew that or not? Oh, they knew it. Oh, yeah, they knew it. And then in Numbers 27, see, um, uh, Moses laid hands on Joshua in front of the whole congregation and, and officially pronounced Joshua the leader of the people. And so Joshua had been the protege of Moses. And then Joshua, see, is the one that uh, stepped in with the priest into the Jordan River and it parted like the Red Sea. And he's the one that in the book of Joshua led him around the city of Jericho seven times. And then the walls came a tumbling down. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho. You know, see, that's, that's what happened. But it's because of Joshua's leadership that he became to the people just like Moses. <clears throat> so after the walls of Jericho came tumbling down and the Jordan River parted and all that, do you think anybody had any question as to whether Joshua was a bona fide prophet of God? Well, no. And so anything Joshua wrote was accepted for the same reason that Moses' writings were accepted. For this reason alone, he was universally accepted as a prophet of God by the people of God, just like Moses had been. And for the same reasons that Moses had been. So, it was when recognized prophets wrote that people accepted the things that they wrote as Holy Scripture. And it's interesting that recognized prophets like Joshua recognized the writings of other prophets like Moses to be inspired Scripture. So there were actually layers of this. All the people recognized Moses, but they also recognized Joshua who also recognized Moses. <clears throat> so even the guys that had hotlines to God recognized other guys that had hotlines to God. And it was like nobody was going to say, no, Joshua is not a real prophet. God doesn't really speak to Joshua. Everybody knew that he did. So it was a no-brainer that his writings were accepted. Now let's talk for a minute about Samuel because the Bible is really specific about Samuel. Let's go to 1 Samuel 
chapter um, 2. Of course, you've heard the story of um, Samuel and how he grew up in the house of Eli, and Eli and his sons were corrupt priests. 1 Samuel 2, verse 26. The boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with men. What does that sound like? Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now go down to um, when God is telling he's going to destroy Hophni and Phinehas. Look down at chapter 2, verse 34 and 35. Read that for us there, uh, Jeremiah. It's 1 Samuel 2, 34 and 35. This will be the sign to you which will come concerning your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. On the same day, both of them will die. But I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and in my soul. And I will build him an enduring house and he will walk before my anointed always. Okay, so he's, he's talking about Samuel. So then you get to um, 1 Samuel chapter 3. And you've got the story of the little boy Samuel. Notice in verse 1 of chapter 3, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions, so there wasn't much revelation going on. Uh, Look down at verse 7. Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. But then God starts calling him, Samuel, Samuel, and he finds out it's not Eli, but it's somebody else. And so God gives him a revelation, and he tells it all to uh, Eli, just like God told him. So look at verse 18 through the end of the chapter there, please. Aaron, read it for us. 18 through the end. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Thus Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fail. All Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, because the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And one more line. Uh, Thus the word of Samuel came to all Israel. There you go. Now look particularly at verse 20. Does that not state the canonical principle pretty well right there? Mm -hmm. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba, from south to north, from north to south, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. So having recognized that, see if you keep reading a chapter or two, then it gets time for... um, Saul, the son of Kish, to be appointed king, and who do they go looking for? Well, they go looking for the man of God that is in this town, the man of God who was called a prophet or a seer, and that's Samuel. Everybody knows he's the man of God. And so Samuel ends up uh, anointing Saul as the king, and look at 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 25. Uh, Ben, are you still reading New King James? No, I have the NASB. You changed. No, I've only had the I've only had the NASB. Oh, you have. I usually read New King James. Yeah. Who's that? Aaron. Well, what is what does yours say in First Samuel ten twenty five? The New King James says. Then Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. All right. Here says the behavior of the royalty. And, you know, is he talking about the the actions of these kings like David and Saul and all the rest of these that we have in the book of uh, 1 Samuel? Some translations say the regulations of the kingdom. Some translations say something different, but it's like there was stuff about the kingdom of Israel and stuff that Samuel wrote down. And it says, he wrote it on a scroll and laid it up before the Lord. 
What other book was laid up before the Lord in the tabernacle? The Law of Moses. So if Samuel's writings were laid up before the Lord, that tells you something about the status of those writings, doesn't it? <clears throat> but why would they accept Samuel's writings and give them that status? Because chapter 3, verse 20 says, All Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. <clears throat> when the people of God universally accepted a person as a prophet of God, whatever that person wrote was immediately and automatically recognized as Holy Scripture. Does that make sense to you? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so um, let me see if I've got some more stuff in here. Yeah. Let's talk for a minute about um, Isaiah. Uh, let's go to the book of Second Kings. All right, so let's go to Second King. Excuse me, Second Kings nineteen. <clears throat> Second Kings nineteen, and look at verse one. <clears throat> when King Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and went to the temple of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and the leading priests, all wearing sackcloth, to find who? To find the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos. <clears throat> See, everybody knew that if they had to talk to God, they needed to go to find the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos. And uh, go down to... Um, Verse 20 of that chapter, 2 Kings 19, 20. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent a message to Hezekiah. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I have heard your prayer. This is the word that the Lord has spoken against him. So, you know, they depend on Isaiah to um, tell them what God says. Look down in chapter 20. <clears throat> in those days... Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, went to him and said, See, what we've got is the book of Kings, which is a totally different book than the book of Isaiah, is calling Isaiah, the son of Amos, the prophet that everybody went to, to find out what was what. See? And uh, so... This is, the, this is the concept. People understood that Isaiah was a prophet, and that's why they went to him and they accepted the things that Isaiah wrote. Now, if you go to, <clears throat> excuse me, if you go to Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, <clears throat> excuse me, And the, the tagline on this book in Isaiah 1 verse 1 is the vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah the son of Amot saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And then you have the record of all these visions. For some reason, I'm wanting to turn to Isaiah 37. Let me see what we got in Isaiah 37. Yeah, we've got the same thing as in 2 Kings. But I was thinking in here some where we had the terminology, the man of God, in here. And I've probably underlined it in my other Bible, but I don't... 
know that I have it underlined in this one. <clears throat> anyway, the point is, is what is it? Uh, nope, that's not the right one. Never mind. Anyway, if you if you research this out enough, you can find that that these guys, like Samuel, like Isaiah, they had a reputation. It was a huge reputation, and everybody referred to them as the prophet or the man of God. And even if they hated his guts, they all knew he was a prophet of God, and so they listened, whether they wanted to or not, when he said something, because they knew where he was coming from. Okay. <clears throat> um I don't think I want to go any further than that right now, but I'd like to entertain some of your questions. We may not answer them, but we will entertain them. Tyler, you're making me so happy. I just want to go back to uh, Clayton's question that he had. Last oh, class. about if you have a job interview? Yeah. Okay. So you're you're gonna the biggest thing in, in a job interview is uh, you want to write something up that's like a little resume. Tell about your experience if you've preached some different places for Philly and preaching. Um, <clears throat> tell about your strengths. What you think are your strengths? Uh, I'm good at at uh, personal evangelism and I uh, or I'm good at this or that and I think I can help in this area then present yourself well when you go there don't don't go with your um, drawers hanging down you know from your butt and with your shirt tail hanging out and with <clears throat> you know clean up put a put a nice uh, tie on or something and go and and uh, present yourself nicely uh, look at look at the people you're talking to, the, the elders or whoever. Look at them straight in the eyeball and talk with them. Um, be very forthcoming. Uh, tell them you're ready to answer any questions they may have. Describe your... Um, say, I'm young. I've just come out of school. We had a good Bible education. Um, you need to know that I'm fairly conservative on my views. I really believe in the inspiration and authority of the Bible. And I'm going to, you know, if in my teaching, I'll teach pretty straightforwardly everything that you find there. Um, it would be good for you, you know, I'm going to be very conservative on moral issues and things like divorce and just want you guys to know that. Um <clears throat> What questions would you guys like to ask me? Uh, you, you approach it like that. Um, if you have a sample sermon that you think was a good one on tape or something, be sure to send that to them with your resume. Probably if you, if you have a sample sermon that's good that they can listen to, that will be the reason why they call you for an interview. Or because of something you post that says, you know, I'm particularly interested in doing personal evangelism or something, and they're looking for a guy like that, they'll call you because of that, then you'll get an opportunity to um, <clears throat> visit with them. It's probably good if, uh, Clayton, are you married? No, sir. <laughs> okay. I was going to say take your wife with you, but you don't have to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no problem. But it's good to to take whatever family you have with you and introduce them to the congregation as well. Uh, those are all good things. In my little handbook, did you guys did I send that to you? Yes. In, sir. in the first part of that, you'll find several things that you need to cover at the beginning of your interview with uh, elders, things you need to cover. Now, you may not, you don't need to cover all the financial stuff 
until you get past the here's who I am and here's basically the direction I'm coming from and tell me how this will fit with your congregation and will it not or, you know, whatever. You may have a real good discussion there and that may be the end of story because they may be real left-leaning and you're not going to go that way and so it's obvious that you don't need to be working with them or they may be interested. If they're interested... <coughs> Uh, then you need to get into a discussion of finances because if you don't finance, if you don't discuss what you're looking for, then they may not offer you anywhere near what you're looking for. So you need to be very straightforward with them about what you expect financially, and ask them, you know, what do you expect to provide financially? If if we should come here and if they're ready to talk to you they'll tell you and you can say well that sounds good or that sounds not good but in that little handbook I've given you several questions to make sure and cover with them on that make sure you cover all those bases all right y'all have a good rest of the day Happy you too. <laughs> yeah, I didn't do a sticky note. I just wrote it on the, uh, the list for the other thing, so I don't know if you can see it or not. I did not put it on a sticky note. They have a little tiny alarm on the door that goes outside right here. Do my mustache one do that? Wayne does. That's what I was telling you. I hope you're alright, man. I'm good. At least it's just like a. You look so good. No, like a. Just three days of work. Yeah, it's nothing to do.